All right, today we have another episode from the archives with one of my incredible guests. Enjoy. All right, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. My name is Guy McPherson. My mission is to help trauma therapists be their incredible selves, to be human, to be real, not just a clinician. I'm a big believer in who we are is more important than what we know. And this requires cultivating authenticity, genuineness, and vulnerability, and that requires intention. You can learn more about my courses and workshops by going to the traumatherapistproject.com. That's the traumatherapistproject.com. Let's get started. All right, guys, welcome back to the Trauma Therapist Podcast. Very excited to have back as my guest on this podcast, Dr. Edward Tick. Ed, welcome. Thank you, Guy. Honored to be back with you. All right, so Ed Tick, as you recall, is an internationally recognized transformational healer, psychotherapist, writer, and educator. Uh, Ed has worked internationally on the psychospiritual and cross-cultural healing of military and war trauma and on holistic and psychospiritual healing. He was a co-founder and executive director of Soldier's Heart, which after 13 years has recently closed its doors. We're going to be talking about that today. He was the Army's U.S. Army's 2012 trainer in the holistic healing of PTSD, training over 2,500 chaplains and officers. Ed is also the author of six books, including The Groundbreaking, War and the Soul, as well as Warrior's Return, Restoring the Soul After War. Um, Ed, uh, obviously that's just a little bit about you, but share with our listeners first before we kind of dig in here, dive in here, where you're from, where you're calling from, and then let's do it. Okay, well, I'm calling from Belchertown, Massachusetts. Nobody knows where that is. Uh, uh, my wife and I bought an old 1850 farmhouse that hadn't been loved for decades. Wow. We, uh, just recently finished restoring it, so we live on a mountain in central Massachusetts. Wow, sounds amazing. It's amazing. It's very beautiful and directly related to our conversation. We both know and affirm that beauty and serenity – and deep connection with nature and the, the spiritual and visible world is critical when we're doing trauma work. So uh, I've got a refuge now where I, I can live and work and also have the universe beyond trauma uh, helping sustain me. All right. So, you know, when I reached out to you, um, I was excited to, you know, uh, see your response, and you you said you know things are kind of shifting for you, um, in in a big way. So give us give us a little context. What and uh, what's what's going on? Sure. Well, uh, in terms of uh, how my life and work are shifting, I'd like to mention two things. One is that, as you shared with our audience, uh, my nonprofit Soldier's Heart. Is, has just closed. In fact, tomorrow, February 28th, is officially our last day. So I thank you especially for this in, uh, this opportunity to share and reflect with you, and it helps as a closing ritual. Uh, what I would like to share with our listeners is that uh, the reason Soldier, Soldier's Heart has been operating for 13 years as a nonprofit, I've been working with our veterans since the end of the Vietnam War before PTSD was even a diagnosis. So I've been in, at this work for uh, over 40 years, for about 43 years. Um, and it has been a great honor. Uh, and I have certainly, I've grown and changed in ways that I never could have imagined. And I'm very grateful for it. Um, I am part of the brotherhood and sisterhood. I've earned my place. Uh, so regarding the closing of our nonprofit, we have, we've run over 40 retreats in 13 years. We've done that many or more trainings. I have been leading trips to Vietnam for 18 years. That began before Soldier's Heart, and I intend to continue that and continue this work. But here's the crisis. Our nation and our world are in such crisis now that and the, our present government is withdrawing support from all kinds of uh, profound social needs. And so in the nonprofit world, applications for help from environmental groups, uh, citizen action groups, women's rights, abortion rights, immigration groups, every challenged group, is they're no longer getting 
federal help or government help, and so they're turning to the nonprofits. So uh, applications are way up in the nonprofit world while the available money is down mm. because, you know, it's going to the billionaires. Uh, and so we've been informed by our most loyal supporters that they're no longer going to support military or veteran causes because there are so many causes uh, and the wars aren't going away and the politicians aren't talking about them or questioning them. Uh, and we've gotten lots of notes of gratitude and profound regret that we can't support this work anymore because too many other immediate needs are surfacing and falling apart. So there's a big warning to us all about the need for nonprofit work, the need for community gathering and organizing, and also, tragically, decreasing awareness, sensitivity, involvement in military and veteran healing. That's half of what's going on. So I'm, I will continue privately as I, what I, as I was doing before I founded Soldier's Heart. But uh, we are going through a very sad but honorific closing process. Wow. Um, now, I'm assuming this has kind of been uh, happening for, for some time, that a decrease in the funding you've had, or has it just like, has it just been a well, groundswell? Been, and- quite seriously, it happened with the new administration. Okay. Two years ago, as this new administration came in, uh, Nonprofits started to go into crisis and many disappeared. Uh, Soldier's Heart has been around for 13 years, which is a good record for a modest sized nonprofit. Most of them don't survive, survive for about five years. Mm-hmm. So, in one sense, the handwriting is on the wall. Um, the wars are going on, the politicians aren't talking about it. Um, on the other hand, you and, and I and our other trauma therapist colleagues have made significant contributions. And transformations in the way we think and talk about trauma. And I want to go in that direction with you as well. Um, so it's been shrinking um, and of concern, but suddenly in the last year, it, it went from shrinking to fire alarms going off. It's over. Mm-hmm. So for, for, for you, I mean, I would imagine as there is there anger is there obviously there's frustration how do what's move what's going on for you personally in this transition well uh if i summarize and reduce it i feel a profound and strange mixture of great honor and great sorrow as i reflect on what we've done And how my work and my organization, Soldier's Heart, has really been in the lead in exploring and revealing and responding to our psycho-spiritual wounds, the invisible wounds of war, at the most archetypal level. And we've had extraordinary success and hundreds, maybe thousands of people have been touched by the work and found it to work. Mm -hmm. It really works. Um, The archetypal imagery of the warrior, the world warrior traditions, the way other cultures have successfully responded to massive violent trauma in their warriors and in their civilians, the fact that there are some places in the world where massive violence has gone on or is going on, and yet those cultures are united, they communalize the trauma rather than pathologize and individualize it, And it's possible to pass through severe violence without the epidemic breakdowns we have here. Mm -hmm. Uh, But uh, it's very hard to get that message across uh, to funders or to our trauma field. And this is my second direction of concern, and I share it with you and with all of our good colleagues. We all want to address the massive and monstrous suffering that's going on. And we're all looking for effective ways to doing it, to do it. And I'm profoundly concerned that trauma is being pathologized and that that's a way our culture denies the extent of global trauma that we're really in. I'm not only concerned about our military and veterans, that remains at the top of my concern 
and my devotion, of course. But what I see is that we are all together, I'm talking about the world, has moved into global trauma. We are in apocalypse. It's not coming, it's here. And every one of our our entire, um, not just the infrastructure, our social structures are falling apart. Now, apocalypse means everything is falling apart so that the underpinnings, the foundations are revealed and the shadow, the human shadow comes pouring out and we're really experiencing that. Apocalypse also gives us the opportunity for significant personal, social, communal change, but the destruction we're causing to the planet is so severe, our weapons are so destructive that, and that we don't know if we're going to make it through this apocalypse. Apocalypse has come before and humanity has survived, but the degree of terror that we're not going to survive is extreme and it's way not only in our military, it's everybody. And so, um, so I am concerned that we can... We, in our nation, we are continuing to use PTSD and now moral injury as diagnoses of mental unhealth rather than what they are, which is categories of human existence and experience that we all have and should not be pathologized, but it should be treated in communal settings and with archetypal with social with psychological and spiritual awareness and and wisdom rather than everybody that breaks down is an individual mental health crisis and treated that way while the rest of us seem to well pass but we're not passing we're all disturbed i mean th- that is a that is a huge and i think very powerful message um i mean how do you take that now in what way are you moving forward? In what way are you carrying that that message forward? Uh, I've begun over the last year in my public education work, lectures and keynotes and, and interviews like this. Uh, I'm moving from military to global trauma. I've learned so much with our warriors about the nature of massive trauma. That it is, it does put us in a death, uh, a live or die, kill or be killed, um, life or death condition. It puts us on the moral edge where we are questioning everything, where our souls are deeply involved and struggling with what is right and what is wrong. Now, what is true and what is false? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, from from the top down, when we're fed falsehoods, uh, it confuses everybody. Way back in uh, The Art of War, Sun Tzu said, if leaders will treat their warriors as their beloved children, then the warriors will follow them everywhere into the depths of hell. But if the leaders mislead them or are immoral or give them wrong causes, uh, the the army will fall apart. And all the soldiers will be wounded and they won't want to follow. We're in that condition. So what I'm doing uh, now is trying to educate people what we have learned from military trauma that, in fact, we're all experiencing now in the environment, in our society, in our families, uh, really across the board. Uh, And I'm working as I have been and you have been working to wake up the population to the needs of our military and warriors, which is a necessary mission, I'm extending that to try work to work, wake up the population to be really aware and concerned of the archetypal condition that we're in and that we all have to wake up and we all have to get really strong in internally and spiritually and we have to come together in community um, Again, as some other cultures communalize their trauma so there's not the individual breakdown. We need to be doing that, for, for especially for our, our warriors and, and violence survivors, but really for all of us now. I would have, uh, you know, in, through Soldier's Heart, obviously you were working with uh, veterans, you were uh, creating programs and groups and trainings and workshops and you know, working with those individuals. Now that you're moving into uh, this 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 topic of global trauma, how do you see 
yourself actually, you know, bringing it down to okay, what are we going to do? What are you, what is, what are you expecting people to do or hoping people can do? I mean, you mentioned you know making people aware, but what is what is the message or the hope that people will can, will or can do to to help with this? I'm going to refer again to some of the cultures that I studied and visited where um, they, they deal with trauma very differently. Uh, and those cultures can be models for us, not just um, the impact on and fate of the individual survivor. Uh, so as you know, I go to Vietnam every year. I've been there 18 times leading healing and reconciliation journeys. And while that's valuable to talk about regarding war healing, let's apply it to the global trauma. Vietnam has been invaded for 2,000 years by powers much larger than theirs. Uh, the United States war over there was only the last. Uh, and yet there's no PTSD, there's no chronic debilitating PTSD in Vietnam. They, their, their psychological establishment does report short-term traumatic breakdowns, which are normal after car accident or coming out of war. The last time the Vietnamese saw PTSD as we have it here was in the 1970s after the American war ended and it only lasted for a short time. They communalize trauma so that there are national, they take their national holidays very seriously. Their Memorial Day is not the beginning of summer time for a picnic. Their version of Memorial Day, and Israel as well. Right. Also, Israel reports a country that's always at war, unfortunately, that's always threatened and threatening, reports less than 1% PTSD rate. It's for the same reason. They, the nation communalizes trauma. So in both countries, their Memorial Days are very deep, sincere times of grieving, where the whole country shuts down and they do national rituals together. Uh, they have many other holidays that we don't have. Like the Vietnamese have a holiday for the MIAs, for the missing in action. They call them the wandering souls because their bodies haven't been found and, and the funerals mm -hmm. haven't been completed. Well, we still have about 2,000 MIAs. They have a quarter million. So they've got a holiday called the Day of Wandering Souls. And Again, everything stops and everybody prays and remembers the, their lost ones and uh, does communal activities. These are only a few examples, but my point is that we need to communalize trauma, not just retreat into our own nuclear family lives and hope it doesn't hurt us or struggle individually to survive. But we really, in small and large ways, need to get together in communities, not only talking about this and becoming aware, but really changing the way we act with each other and, um, and kind of trying to... Well, it's hard, but every apocalypse needs spiritual awakening of the masses in order to bring about the transformation. And it seems like our world is in a uh, transform for the better or die mm -hmm. uh, moment. One of the most delicate moments in all of history. And so we really have to wake up. And, of course, our veterans, our warriors can be leaders in this. I mean, what you're talking about is really no less than a, a kind of a cultural shift in uh, perception about how things are, how trauma is uh, perceived and treated and integrated into, into the culture. You know, right now, I mean, you've got thousands of people who are listening to this most of whom, many of whom are, are therapists of all different kinds or survivors themselves. Yes. What's the message? You know, when they, when they get off this, when they get, when they get done listening to this, what do you want them to feel or what do you want them to do or how would you like them or, or invite them to, to shift, to do something differently so that they can help, yes. help create this change? Okay. So to all of our brother, sister trauma workers out there, first, let's affirm, as Buddha said, that life is suffering. Uh, and trauma is the form of suffering we have 
now that, that's dominating the world. Secondly, every historical period has its um, his, its keynote um, wound or illness or disorder. So we had hysteria in the Victorian times, and we had schizophrenia in the 60s, and that, that fit. And we had character disorder in the 80s and 90s. They, those all fit the conditions of the culture that we're living in. Now we've got trauma, and mm-hmm. everybody's talking about it, and we should be. And it's good that so many therapists are responding. Okay. That being said, we need to accept it as a core human condition rather than pathologize it. It's a human condition that we can all suffer to different degrees and we are affected in body, mind, heart, spirit, community, and meaning, all of the above. When we only bless everybody who's doing so much good, uh, such good broken brain work, and understanding how trauma has impacted the brain. But please, please, colleagues out there, don't just settle with broken brain work. You also have to, we have to engage the heart, the body, the soul, our spiritual core, and the community. Mm -hmm. And so please, all of us, make sure we're working on all of those levels, and especially, especially, it's terrible that we have to beg for it, but I guess it's always been true. The spiritual level, we need to go so deeply inside ourselves that we can find the core that is stronger, stronger than trauma, stronger than suffering, and work together to get our spirits to rise above it. And like Israel and like Vietnam and like our Native American communities, to really, really come together in community working publicly through ritual, through ceremony, through um, storytelling circles, through owning the depth of our wound and that we're all in it together uh, and, and become active. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I was a keynote speaker at a trauma conference in Canada. So this is international. And at our closing panel, people asked the same question. What can we therapists do? Most of the therapists on the panel, most of the keynote speakers said, well, there's nothing we can do except help the victims, so keep doing good trauma work in your office. And I said, "Um, I'm going to disagree with that. That's necessary but not sufficient. Therapists, also, get out of your offices. Get into the community. Teach the community what we know. Talk in libraries, talk at colleges, talk in high schools, talk in your, in your houses of worship. But we can't stay sequestered in our offices anymore. Mm-hmm. We have specialized knowledge, wisdom, and techniques for addressing the global crisis that we're in. And we need to get out of the office and bring it there. So I said, uh, I'm, this is my message to all of our colleagues and and some will p- applaud and some will hate me for it. <laughs> and that's what happened in Canada, too. I swear, I got a half of a room of a standing ovation. And the other half were moaning and groaning and hiding their faces. And No, I'm not going out there where it, it, it's safe. to. Sorry, guys. It's safe for us to be therapists and keep it in our office. But the world is not safe anymore. And we need to take what we have. Not criticizing being a therapist at all, but saying it has such profound social, political, spiritual, communal implications. We need to carry it out. I mean, when you think of, you know, uh, the challenge of uh, working with with, with trauma, uh, oftentimes there's therapists themselves, obviously, and, and uh, individuals, clients themselves have Difficulties, challenges, working in in that kind of micro environment, and you're really asking for an unfolding on a, on a grand scale to happen. Um, what do you think are some of the challenges for this? Oh goodness! Well, I'm going to quote one of our veterans: "Denial is the all American disease." <laughs> That's the whole quote, buddy. Uh, and that's true. That's what I think uh, challenge is. The biggest challenge, we are a nation in denial. Uh, perhaps we're a world in denial. 
and because of the denial, and so it's easy to pathologize anybody who does who's suffering and doesn't fit in and separate them from the rest of us. That protects the rest of us. Right. So we're in denial, and we're also terribly greedy, and we we want stuff, and we don't want our comfortable individual lives disturbed. But you know, when we look at our our uh, issues with our veterans. Um, in general, the public doesn't know what to do. A lot of people want to help but don't know how. But very many people don't want to be touched. Don't tell me about the wars. Don't tell me uh, what what our veterans or what the other people have gone through in the war zone. Um, because it's, it's quite horrific and the public doesn't know how horrible it is. Uh, and so I would say the... Uh, denial is our biggest problem and fear of seeing and feeling the extraordinary dimensions of pain that are out there uh, is really what's beneath it and people seem to have I don't know if it's culturally conditioned or built into us but generally people have a revulsion uh, against encountering trauma or or violence uh, and its aftermath which is also why we need our warriors, because you know this, you practice this. Warriors go into danger while the general population flees from danger. Warriors protect us. Warriors go out on the line where it's dangerous while all others back away. That's happened in the mass shootings that we've had. It's been veterans in the crowd turning and running into the guns to uh, protect the, the rest of the innocent. So we need our warriors more than ever, and we all need to overcome our resistance and denial and admit how difficult things are and and find ways to be in it together. If, you know, someone were to come to you and and say, all right, Ed, you know, I've I've read your, your thought, I listened to the podcast you did with Guy, how do you... Ideally, how would you like to kind of operationalize this in a sense? How would you like to uh, formalize this campaign, if you will? I mean, if you if you had you know uh, all the resources at your disposal, ideally, what would you like to see, or what would you like to have happen? Well, goodness, well, all the resources, sure. Uh, then I would uh, begin by making Memorial Day and Veterans Day very serious national holidays. See, we, we could do this. Um, if the malls shut down and if leadership and people like us made enough public noise, um, letters to the editor, op-eds, interviews like this, getting on radios, and We closed the malls on Memorial Day and taught people the real meaning of the holiday again and gathered in our houses of worship, in our civic centers to to share who we're remembering this day. Who are we grieving? What are we grieving? Um, And to visit everybody, visit the cemeteries. Um, And if we had significant Uh, public announcements from leadership leading us into memorializing rather than proselytizing patriotism. Um, That's one example of how a holiday we already have could become a serious national spiritual holiday reminding us of uh, the the original meaning, bringing us together, and um, facilitating national grieving that would heal us all and help bring us all together. Mother's Day is coming also. How many people know that Mother's Day was in was, was a memorial day after the Civil War? Julia Ward Howe created it in, what, 1880s um, as a declar- uh, the Mother's Day proclamation, asking all the mothers of the world to no longer send their, their sons to war to kill other people's children. How about if we just read the Mother's Day proclamation on Mother's Day instead of sending candy? <laughs> Okay, we can go on and on with this guy. I'm so serious, and we do have the means for doing it. Other cultures do, and we do, of course, have to start at at, at an individual level, one-on-one, and help people understand what they're carrying. Um, 
I'm working with two people I can think of right now. Um, one woman is working on uh, helping, trying to prevent the use of our hyper technology in outer space. She's a scientist right at the edge where research becomes military research and is used in horrific ways. Okay, so she came for help because she's in horrible moral dilemma. Mm -hmm. She does have moral injury. And the other people she went to told her, well, you're having a psychotic break. You're feeling too much. You're hypersensitive and you're having nightmares and you must be going psychotic. Well, she's not. As soon as we start to explore her work and how she feels about it and that she knows that we're on the edge of profound danger if her work is misapplied. She's not psychotic. She's profoundly morally and spiritually disturbed. And it only took a couple of meetings for to to to, uh, in, to introduce that to her, to evaluate whether this is really a, a psychotic break or not, and to hear how frustrated she is in trying to bring this out into her community of scientists, to, to for you know for her to start to normalize. I'm on a serious moral mission that other people don't get, but they have to get, and I have to develop the inner strength to carry it through rather than break down because I'm getting resistance. Right. So this works on the individual level as well. And when people feel their wounds, and we do this with our warriors, of course, when people feel their wounds are being recognized for what they are and honored, not pathologized, and we're giving them, this is really important, we're giving them imagery through the healing process that fits who they are archetypally, not imagery that is unrelated and, and that we're telling them uh, really become somebody else rather than embrace your own experience and we can we can transform it. We can treat we can treat traumatic experience as initiatory. Uh, one chap and I worked with he wrote uh, well he. He didn't say this to me. I'm remembering uh, an article that he published saying to everyone, it was an op-ed piece, don't, don't think I am less and I am broken because I've been to war. I am more. War has made me more than I ever could have imagined I would be. It has taught me the mysteries of life and death and of what brings people together and breaks them apart and... I'm not glad there's war, but I'm very honored that I was there and that I've been made bigger, deeper, wiser because of it. That's what we're working for. Has the um, attitude and uh, perception or uh, been been shifting at all with regards to um, how not only veterans experience and perceive their own trauma, but how the, the civilians, the public, perceives veterans? Uh, well, first, let's, uh, you're, I wonder if you, uh, you're experiencing this as well, but our younger veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, in large part, are rejecting the PTSD diagnosis, and they're not, or they're, they're leaving therapy uh, that tries to impose that on them, and instead they're going to the arts so we ha are actually in a renaissance of, of creative writing, drama, poetry, novels, storytelling, uh, music, um, art, uh, visual arts coming out of the, the younger veterans. So they are saying, don't treat me like I'm a broken uh, person and don't pathologize me, but let me express what's going mm. on in me. Uh, and in communities where they're doing, uh, there is good turnout. And more civilians are saying now, I believe, than in past years from the work of all of our colleagues and our lawyers, uh, more civilians are saying, I want to help, but I don't know how, rather than, I can't help and get this away from me and send it to the VA. Right. So there, there, it's a teachable moment in history where we can hopefully mobilize civilians to have a very different attitude toward trauma. 
In addition to that, we both know this too, and our colleagues are out there. There are so many um, holistic health practices for warriors now. Equine therapy and art, creative arts therapies and yoga and drama and um, working directly with reprogramming the brain. We could go on and on, but uh, our field and people involved in it are seeing trauma more holistically and seem to be getting more involved with healing. And the younger veterans for sure are asking for new creative and holistic and heart and soul oriented means for working with their wounds. It feels uh, to me, Ed, like you're truly on the cusp of creating a, 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 a groundswell, a shift in, in cultural awareness. Uh, well, thank you. I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I it, hope- I hope yeah. we're there to, sir. <laughs> it, it feels like it. You know, doing doing these interviews uh, week in and week out and speaking with people who are, uh, many of whom are, you know, thought leaders in the field, you're, you're taking, it feels like you're taking this dragon by the neck and saying, wait a minute, this is what we have to look at. This is where we have to, the direction in which we have to go. Um, I mean, we could go on and on I, in, in the interest of time here. Um, let's let's kind of take a take a few moments to close out. I just want to remind everyone that I'm speaking with Dr. Edward uh, Tick. What's the best way for people to reach out to you? Uh, well, as you as we've shared, Soldier's Heart is closed now, so there's only a notice on my webpage and how to get a hold of me. So I have a newly email address, which is simply Dr. Ed Tick, D R E D T I C K, eight mm-hmm. little letters at Gmail, and my new office phone is. Five one eight seven two seven eight zero nine zero. 727 People can get me that way. And I do have a new website up. It's just my name, edwardtick.com. Okay. So people can find me with any of those. Any okay. Of those. And then lastly, a, any go-to book recommendations, um, yeah. whether, whether uh, trauma-related or not? Sure. Um, I'm going to reiterate that I recommended Homer and the Bible in our first interview, but let's go into some of the most, the more important uh, new work that's coming out. So, of course, I grab it, grab a moment to plug my own two books, War and the Soul and Warriors Return, and I do uh, want to share with everybody that many, many trauma survivors who are non-military are also reading and using those books and understanding their own psycho-spiritual wounding and transformation better. So the books, though they focus on veteran uh, trauma, are not exclusively. Um, a couple of books in the in our trauma field I would highly recommend. Uh, one are not very well known, but brilliant. The work of uh, Robert Emmett Marr, spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R. Uh, so I couldn't pronounce it until I met him. But Bob Marr. Okay. Uh, and He's got several books out. Um, One is called Killing from the Inside Out, where he takes apart the just war theory and shows how it's been misused um, since it was invented. Um, Any of Bob's books. Oh, uh, Heracles Gone Mad. Hercules Gone Mad is another one of his really excellent books on trauma. Um, Look... You can look up the others. Uh, just okay. Okay. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. Very important, critical anthology that he edited. He and Doug Pryor, who was a uh, retired lieutenant colonel. This is just out a few months. It's called War and Moral Injury, and it's a major reader. And you know, p- uh, people like Jonathan Shea and Sebastian Junger and other thought leaders in the field have articles in there. Uh, I have a chapter, but it's very comprehensive and looks at the whole question of moral injury and oh, what wow. it is comes from. So very important. The other book I'll mention that's focusing on moral injury is um, David Wood, who is one of our leading war correspondents. He's out on the front lines with troops all the time. And about a year ago, he came out with a book called What Have We Done? The Moral Injury of Our Most Recent Wars. And that uh, it's not only stories, but um, 
which we get plenty of, but he's showing moral injury in the core of the stories rather than uh, mental illness PTSD. And he's also demonstrating that we don't recognize moral injury until after we're out of the action and have time to think and reflect and realize what it did to us and what we did to others. So that's a very important perspective that the longer we sit with these old wounds, the more we have the opportunity to look at them and what went wrong with them and try to correct it. Awesome. I'll have those linked up at the show notes page here at the trauma therapist podcast.com. Ed, um, uh, it was an honor having you back on here. I'm excited to get this out and let me know, um, if, uh, you know, I can do anything to, uh, and beyond publishing this podcast, if I can do anything to, to help you, because uh, I just I just really admire what you're doing. Thank you so much, Guy. All right, Bless take you. care. Yep, you too. We'll be in contact.